Um, we have five questions that we're going to deal with today. Uh, so what I'm going to do is if you uh, please don't feel that you cannot participate, okay? Today is the day to participate. Ask questions, uh, follow-up questions, follow-up. Uh, rebuttal or whatever it is. Now, I'm going to be doing answering the questions because I have had more time to deal with the questions than most of you. But don't feel that you cannot add to it. So, um, once the question is asked, I will try my best to answer them and then I will give an opportunity if anybody wants to either add to the answer that I gave or you want to react to the answer that I gave. But always, I want us to be mindful of this. There are some questions that we may not have direct answers from the Bible, which means your opinion is just as good as mine. Okay, so I want to make sure that we understand it and we make sure that we let people know uh, this is not from the Bible. Because for us, the Bible is the sole authority in matters of what we believe and what we do. So we want to make sure that all answers are addressed from that position. If I'm not able to address the questions from that position, I will leave it open for discussion. There is also something called uh, Christian ethics and theology. Uh, the words we use for saying, hey, we can debate this. We really don't know the correct answer to it. But let's try and get the best advice that we can get. For the One of the questions today is one of those. Maybe two, two of them. But one has a lot of scriptural support, except that, you know, it could go either way. Okay? So what we will do is uh, Gina is going to read the questions uh, one at a time. And uh, then I will follow up by giving answers. Any question? No question. All right. So, Gina, why don't you go with the first question? Question number one. I have a question about our unsaved family members, specifically our children. I know that the ways of the Lord are not like my ways, and I know that his mercy is beyond what I can wrap my brain around. But both of my children were baptized by their own choice when they were 12 and 13 years old. Both have since walked away from the church, but more critically denied Christ as their savior. They are now in their mid to late 20s. I heard in a teaching by John Corson that when thinking of our unsaved children, to think of Jeremiah 31, 15 through 17, and to stand firm in the salvation of our kids. What are your thoughts on this? Does everyone, does everybody understand the question? Okay. Uh, I think that dealing with a child, your children, is probably the most difficult thing for parents. Especially when they are now 18 or older. Uh, they can do anything they want. Uh, hopefully they're already out of your house. If, they, <laughs> if they're still there, then you probably have a more say on on their situation than when they're gone. But when they're gone, they're on their own. They're uh, free to do whatever they want. So let, let me say that this question also brings up five issues for me. And I want to state those issues, and then we will try to deal with as many of the issues as possible. Again, I'm saying please be open and be willing to consider those issues. I think issue number one to me is what is true conversion? And when is a person really saved? That's the first issue that comes out for me. 
Issue number two is what is baptism and when should baptism be performed? That's issue number two. Issue number three, what is the age of accountability? Now, you don't want to force your children into accepting Christ. Just because you love Christ and you want Christ doesn't mean your child does. But while they are on their age, you have parental responsibility as Christians to train them in the way that they should go so that when they grow up, they will not depart from it. And that's what I think is your responsibility. But we'll deal with that as we go. Uh, Issue number four is asking the question, once saved, ever saved. Is that true? Once you're saved, that means you cannot lose your salvation. Is that true? And the fifth, probably last question or issue that was raised for me in the question is, what is apostasy? What does it mean to deny the faith? Are we all together on that? Okay, so, let, let, yes, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's, that's okay. Good. Okay. All right. Well, let's, I'm going to do it while I'm dealing with the issue. Okay. So, let's, let's deal, first of all, with the fact that John Corson, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correct or not, uh, because I'm not familiar with him and I don't know him. Uh, quoted Jeremiah 31, 15 through 17 to support the statement that you need to stand firm in the salvation of your children. Okay. Uh, so when we look at this passage, let's read uh, Jeremiah. Can you put up there, Jeremiah? Thank you. Jeremiah uh, says, this is what the Lord says. A voice is heard in Ramah. Mourning and great weeping, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because her children are no more. This is what the Lord says. Restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work will be rewarded, declares the Lord. They will, they will return from the land of the enemy. So there is hope for your future, declares the Lord. Your children will return to their own land. Okay, so that is the passage that was used. Basically, I'm not sure if, because I did not hear the message of John, and I did not read the entire presentation that he made, but I believe that this passage is primarily dealing with Israel, okay? And could be applied to our lives in whatever situation we're in if it relates to the situation that the Israelites found themselves, okay? So, however, when you look at the context, when you look at the context, applying this to the salvation of your children will be, eisegesis instead of exegesis, okay? Eisegesis is the practice that we make of introducing what we want into the Bible instead of taking from the Bible what it says to us. So, the point is this, that if you, in in the interpretation of a Bible passage, you have to consider what we call the entire pericope, the entire passage. Sometimes, not just reading the verse that you're dealing with, but reading the whole chapter, and sometimes reading two chapters before, two chapters after, and sometimes even the, reading the whole Bible, I mean the whole uh, book, which would be if it's Jeremiah now, you're reading Jeremiah. If it's 
Joshua, uh, Joshua, you're reading the whole Joshua. If it is Ezekiel, you're reading the whole Ezekiel in order to understand the carefully. So if you read this, even if you apply it to Israel, you will find out that even the wayward Israel that is mentioned in this passage, God says forgiveness is possible only after repentance. So if you read the passage very carefully. So put up 18 through 22 for us, please. 18 through 22 of Jeremiah 31. If I'm getting too verbose and I'm confusing you, just raise your hand so I'll go back. I have surely heard Ephraim's moaning. You discipline me like an unruly calf, and I have been disciplined. Restore me, and I will return because you are the Lord my God. After I strayed, I repented. After I came to understand, I beat my breast. I was ashamed and humiliated because I bore the disgrace of my youth. It's not Ephraim, my dear son, the child in whom I delight. Though I often speak against him, I still remember him. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. I have great compassion for him, declares the Lord. Set up road signs. Put up guideposts. Take note of the highway, the road that you take. Return, O virgin Israel, return to your town. I think I want 22 also. Thank you. How long will you wonder, O oh, unfaithful daughter? The Lord will create a new thing on earth. A woman will surround a man. Okay, so, so if you look at this, you cannot miss the point of repentance. So that's why the passage, train up a child in the way that they should go, so that when they grow up, they will not depart from it. You may not see it. You may not see what God is doing in a person's life. But the seed that you have planted is germinating. Even the devil is not strong enough to take that out. So you have to continue. So let me see. How do you deal with your children? who are no longer in the faith, who have gone away from the faith, who have gone away from the things that you've taught them, how they have been brought up, don't ever stop praying for them. Amen. Don't ever stop praying for them. Because prayer will change a lot of situations. Amen. And sometimes you're wondering how you get through it. How did I get through this? You may not know how many people that were praying for you. When you thought nobody was there, remember footprints in the sand, right? That person complaining, you know, where was Jesus, you know, all this time? You know, I was alone by myself. And I was just saying, uh, look at the footprints. You were not alone. That was, those footprints that you saw, they were mine because I was carrying you. So it's really important that we understand that point. So that's the one thing I would suggest is prayer, strong prayer time. That's why the church needs to pray. That's why you don't need to pray by yourself. That's what we call uh, intercessory prayer. You need to ask your friend. You need to ask your pastor. You need to ask your deacon. You need to ask your Sunday school teacher. You need to ask your step group leader, please pray for my child. And so you have several people praying for them. The second thing I believe we need to do, there are some very, very good books out there. One of my favorite writers is C.S. Lewis. And C.S. Lewis, uh, most of you are probably familiar with the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, about seven in the volume, maybe more, I don't know. But um, I read those several times. He has also written some books that I would highly re- recommend that you buy, for example, for a Christmas gift this year. The first 
book I would recommend you give is Mere Christianity. M-E-R-E, Christianity. Uh, in there, uh, C.S. Lewis really uh, breaks down. For, number one, you need to understand the story of C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis was a philosophy professor that denied the existence of God and denied Jesus for a long time. And when he became a Christian, the first book he wrote was Surprised by Joy. And Joy used to uh, happen to be his wife. Uh, uh, and how he became a Christian was through influence uh, of uh, uh, Joy in his life. So talked about that. There's also another book that I would recommend from uh, C.S. Lewis. It's called The Screw Tape Letters. Screw tape is one word. Screw tape letters. Uh, I really... You know, it was uh, like a communication between the devil and a person. And uh, talks about a lot of issues that young people deal with that, you know, can be helpful to them. You know, say, hey, here's the book I'm giving to you so you can become a Christian. No. Just this is a gift. It's a book. If they love reading. Now, you don't want to give books to people who can't read. Okay? <laughs> or people who don't want to read. Okay? But if you know that they love to do that, uh, uh, that would be one thing that I will recommend that you, that you uh, do. Uh, the last thing that I will recommend that you do is, if you can, whenever you can, find a book that deals, or a track, or a pamphlet that deals with philosophical issues and how people can go from philosophy or science into, into God. That's, you know, very helpful. And there are many of them. If you don't have one or you want me to, you know, uh, get you some, I will do that. Okay. Now, real quickly, let's look at this. What is true conversion? What is true conversion? When does a person really become a Christian? I think I've shared with you many times that when Joshua was growing up there, many times he wanted to accept Christ and be baptized. And I delayed it, and I delayed it. I kept asking questions, you know, this question, that question, not until he was ready. And you have to, again, what's the age of accountability? When does a person really get to a point where they believe? Uh, because there are a lot of people that say they accept Christ and they're very sincere about it, but it's not true conversion. Okay? So that's why I don't baptize anybody until I'm able to ask them questions about the faith. And I ask it in different ways. I don't want to answer, I don't want to ask questions that require the answer yes or no. Because people will still tell you what they think you want to hear or what they have memorized. So you have to ask them questions that will allow them to debate and think with you and answer those questions. Okay? So uh, there's also a good book that's written by uh, Dr. Kent Philpott. I can't remember the publisher, but if you need a copy, just let me know. Are you really saved? Are you really saved? And that's a good book to read. Um, so, I believe that Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10 should be taken together. Is everybody still with me? I'm not putting anybody to sleep, right? Okay. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10 should be taken together. Sometimes what we do is we just take verses 8 and 9. We take verses 8 and 9 and we say forget everything else. We have to take verse 10 also. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God had beforehand ordained that we should walk in them. 
Your salvation is not complete until uh, verse 10 is evident in your life. So, I ask also, what is uh, the age of accountability? Uh, to me, it depends. Billy Graham was saved when he was nine. I was already 17 when I was saved. There are some people that were saved when they were in their 80s or 90s. Yes, you have a question. Hold, hold, on, hold on. I have a, a Bible verse. What do you think about the Second Corinthians 5.17? Therefore, if any was in it, is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. That so, actually applies to verse 10, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Yeah. I was thinking that you would become a new creation and you would know right away. You would become this creation that God gave you and you wouldn't go to your old ways. Correct. Not only that, but to me, it's a continuing thing. It's, it's a continuing thing, you know. So, yeah. okay. So, uh, the age of accountability to me simply is when the person really knows what sin is. What is sin? And what is the original sin? If you really cannot answer those questions, you're not ready. It doesn't have to tie to the age. And that ties to baptism also. Don't baptize people because they want to be baptized. My first baptism was done when I didn't even know I was on earth. My parents went to the Catholic church. And they were still worshiping voodoo. But they had to put me in there because it's a tradition for you to go to the Catholic church and be baptized. If you're not saved and you get baptized, you're just like the devil getting being baptized. What happens? When you come out, you just have a wet devil. <laughs> Nothing happens. So, yeah, that's why it's important. A lot of people, they, they fight my system. I said, no, I'm not going to baptize you until we talk. I don't care how many people I've talked to you. I'm the one baptizing you. Now, that does not make, mean that I have not made mistakes since then. Because if everybody I've baptized stayed in the church, we won't have room in here. People will be outside, all over the window, listening to my message. Because even sometimes when you go and you ask and you ask and you think you ask several ways to make sure they know what they're doing, they say yes, you know, and it doesn't happen. Yes, Oni, one more question. So, so you're saying that people, they come to Christ, they get baptized, correct? Yes. But they fall out the way. Yeah. That isn't a new creation. Correct. So they are not believers. They're not following the way. You're correct again. <laughs> so they shouldn't be baptized. Well, I'm not Jesus Christ, right? Because Jesus can know what you're thinking. He knows everything about you, but I don't. But if so they don't when follow you the way, to, then I don't think they should be baptized. They should well, follow the way Well, if you first. tell a person... I am accepting Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, right? I want to follow him. I know this is a way. You have no reason not to baptize them. You tell them that, but they don't do it. They have to start doing it first, right? Well, you cannot say, according to the Bible, if we're going by the Bible. Yes. Do you remember uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch? 
It's in, it's in the book of Acts. You need to read it when you get home. Yes, sir. Okay? Uh, they didn't even go to a church. They were riding after the eunuch accepted and said, do you know what you're reading? And he said, he, Philip explained to him what, the, what Isaiah was talking about, the person Isaiah was talking about, and he accepted the message. And he said, well, there's water. What would prevent me from being baptized? And they went in there and got baptized. So you don't wait to see how a person is going to do before you baptize them. Amen. Baptism should follow conversion. If a person accepts Christ as their Lord and Savior, and they truly accept Christ as their Lord and Savior, you need to baptize them. You cannot play God. You can't say, I know you're not serious. I, you know, let me wait a year to see how you're going to do, or whatever. You can't do that. That's why... I know I have baptized at least a thousand people. There were some that I baptized last year that's no longer here. I'm not responsible for that. They're responsible for that. That's why I need to ask them before I baptize them, is this what you mean? Is this what you're saying? If you say yes, I have no reason not to baptize you. Do you understand what I'm saying, Oni? Okay, so uh, if I have all knowledge, thank God I don't. <laughs> okay, if I have all knowledge, I will know who to baptize and who not to baptize, but I don't. So I have to do the best thing that I can do as the pastor, as the leader, to ask the person, is this what you mean? Is this what the decision you're making? Once you do that, every pastor has that responsibility. Now, sometimes we don't. We don't ask them. They just come, you know. But even when you ask, it's not going to guarantee that that person is going to stay. Before you baptize them, afterward is discipleship. Yeah, afterwards is discipleship, and we need to do that. Now, most of the time, churches are not good about discipleship. So we have to... We have to face the fact that we need to do better in that area. Okay. Now, once saved, ever saved. Most of you know that I am a Calvinist. Okay. In theology, there are some called the Armenians. Armenians feel that you can lose your salvation. Calvinists think you cannot lose your salvation. I, I fall in that field. I am a diehard Calvinist, okay? And it would take us weeks for me to explain that to you, okay? But the point is, I believe that many people who say they're saved are not really saved. God does not bake cakes that fall in the middle. Okay, when he bakes it, they're ready to be eaten, the whole cake. Amen. And that is my God. When he saves you, nobody can snatch you out of his hand. He said, my sheep hear me, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone be able to snatch them out of my hand. Jesus himself said that. Yes. Joanna? So I have a question about people who maybe accepted Christ when they were younger and now they've fallen away. So is the goal then to try to get them to accept Christ for real or to bring them back to church? Because if they weren't ever really saved, then... Sh I'm just confused on if yes. the goal is to try to actually get them to accept. Your question is very complicated, but let me answer it the best way that I can. What I would like to do is witness to them about Christ. And if they say that I have already done that, I believe that, and I know that, then you will know what next to do, that will to get them involved in a place where they can be discipled. 
where they can be taught. Because in the New Testament, there's really no Christian that is on an island. You can't find it. Not in the Bible. It's nothing like, I'm saved now. Bye-bye. I'm on my own. It's not, it's not the Bible. You cannot find it anywhere in the Bible. So once you're saved, you will follow Jesus based on what the Bible says and based on what we have seen in the Bible. And the fact that we're even here today is a testimony to that. Christianity did not start in America. But we are Christians here today because of discipleship and because of follow-up. And I think that's where the problem is the most, is that many of the churches today don't do discipleship at all. You have a follow-up question. Yeah, um, (laughs) because it's confusing for me also because so that person was raised in the church, were saved, um, and they've fallen away. Is that because they weren't discipled or because they weren't really saved? I'm thinking of friends specifically who've gone and become Jehovah's Witnesses or who've become Muslim. And so I guess for the time when they did fall away and they weren't in church, I don't know if the question yeah. is what happened, but I guess how how best to reach out to them to try to disciple or to actually try to save them. I think one of the things we can do is pray for, for them. I, I, took, I took a class in religion and Christianity. Believe me, they're two different things. Okay. And one of the things we had to do in the class was go to every religious group. We went to the Buddhist temple. We went to the mosque. We went to even Satan's church in San Francisco. Okay? So, the thing is, one, one thing that I learned that was true in most of those groups is that most of the people that were there used to belong to a church. You come here on Wednesday night when we have general cell group and you see how strong our church is in the Bible. Even people that are here today who don't feel they need to know more, they need to learn more, we don't take it seriously at all. So when it comes to Bible study, when it comes to things that make us strong, that make us disciples, we're not interested in it. Some of us just want to come to church, shout, sing, get happy, go home, Come back at the next Sunday. And discipleship doesn't happen that way. And that is one of the reasons why that happens. The other reason could be people are not really saved. Some people come with their friends. Some people come on a Sunday that the song was really good and their emotions were affected and everything like that. And they come crying. Just because a person is crying doesn't mean they're saved. The proof is in staying. Okay. Boy, a lot, a lot. remember we have five questions. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I think discipleship is following, you know, Jesus. We're asking people to follow Jesus. Correct. We're Christians. So a better way, I feel like, is to do something fun with them. Even if it's going out playing basketball, like a cop would. You know, cops are not really people that desire in the community. Some communities, African-American communities. But at times, we'll see videos of them going out and shooting basketball with kids doing something really nice. So I think that in a Christian aspect, that kind-heartedness should be exampled or exemplified in the church. So I, we, I, understand, yeah. I understand your point, yeah. but you can do that at YMCA. Yeah. You can do but it at... It you would have make... a friend in the end. Yeah, I understand that. Yes. I think that's part of it. But discipleship has to do more with teaching a person how to follow Jesus. But you're saying I can't do that through playing basketball with them? No, I'm saying you can do a lot of things, but yes. you cannot just focus on the act. You've got to focus on the reason why you're doing the act. Because I love this person. I really want to play with them, and I, want, I have a kind heart. I want to show them I'm kind. Jesus is kind. This is what it looks like. Okay, you can do that. But, you know, again, I I really believe that we've lost the way if we just think that social aspects is going to make a person stay in Christ. 
That's not going to do it. It's not going to do it. You can do that even if you're not a Christian. You can share love. You can show compassion. You can do everything. You don't have to be a Christian. But when you are a Christian, there is one focus. The focus is to make that person reproduce what you're trying to instill in them. That is the spirit of Jesus Christ. And that's the most important thing. Yes. Um, Hebrews 10, uh, 26 to 31, I believe. Uh huh. Um, I'll read a portion of the passage, basically. Uh, so it reads, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we receive knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and a raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Correct. Um, that, I'm, and that was 26 and 27. Um, yes. I guess my question would be, with that passage of scripture, exactly con- what's the context and how does that relate to the once saved, always saved um, theology that you just brought up a couple of moments ago? Once saved, ever saved? Yeah. Yeah. Again, it's just basically saying, and again, we cannot, that's a total, like I said, I can spend several weeks just dealing with that. You know, it's just a point saying a person cannot say, I am saved, and there are some things still happening in their lives on a consistent basis. You can't. The proof is in the pudding, right? You know, if you say you're saved, you were saved one day. You used to use every language in the world, right? Three years later, you're still using all those three-letter words. Or four. <laughs> or five, you know. I used to work at St. Vincent School for Boys. I never heard some languages until I meet, met those kids. You know, so the point is that uh, Jesus basically says that if you know him, you will bear fruit. It's going to be something happening in your life. Just because you say it doesn't mean it's true. Yes, okay. One more follow-up, then I'm going to miss, go to question number two. Who, who is the next one? Oh. No, go ahead, because I want people to learn from what you're asking. So... My question is, if one save, always save, and you're talking about the proof is in the pudding, Pastor. I'm saved. I, I, you know that I'm saved, or you believe that I'm saved based on the things that I do here in church. But Reginald and I have been cohabitating for the past seven years. Are you telling me that I'm still saved? It's our lifestyle. We're, we're living together. We're not married. Am I still saved? Is he still saved? Uh, well, that actually goes to a question of what is sin. Okay? So, again, and I think, I think a person that is actually cohabitating with someone that they're not married to is a, it's an ongoing situation. If it's an ongoing situation, then they're showing that there's nothing that has happened in their lives. Well, it could be a yes and it could be a no. It could be a yes, you're saved, but you're rebellious and you're disobedient to God. It could be no, you're not saved and you're just in your comfortable environment. You're still dealing with the fact that Satan controls your life. Because, you know, again, those are things that everybody can see. But there are a lot of things that we do that people cannot see that also shows that we're not saved. So that's why that's a very, very difficult uh, question to deal with. Just saying for sure this is it or for sure that is it. Now, let me tell you this. There are a lot of disobedient children of God. Lots of them. Some of them here at Village. I mean, we can go deep into some of the things that you know the Bible says. The Bible says, go to church. You see all the empty chairs? If all our members come, 
the, the chairs will be filled. Amen. So are they saved? Maybe some of them are not. That's another question we've got to deal with later on. And I'm looking at the time. I'm saying I'm not sure we're able to deal with all these questions. Okay. But the point is this, though. We cannot remain in sin and say we are born of the Spirit of God. Light and darkness cannot remain in the same place. The Bible also says if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and we make God out to be a liar. So I'm not the only one struggling with this. Even the Bible struggles with it. If you, if you read uh, Romans chapter 7 and you see how Paul himself was struggling with that issue. Oh, what a wretched man that I am. Who can deliver me from this body of sin? So sin is always there. We just have to be careful that we are not ones that are found always in sin. Because sin tends to develop callousness in us to the point where it comes to a place we don't even know that sin to be sin anymore because we're used to it. We're comfortable with it. We're in the environment and then we become Christian philosophers. Having the a priori for the things that we're doing because we just want to do what our flesh wants. So, what do you say? Repent. <laughs> if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to do what? We always forget that. God forgives me, but he cleans you too. So don't go back to that mud. And we have to stand for truth. You have to stand for it, but you also have to live for it. Confession without action is useless. You're getting me excited here. Yeah. Um, there's a verse in the Bible which says, remember your creator in the days of your youth. Yes. And when you grow old, you will not depart. So my question is, if I have... I'm not sure it says when you grow old, you will not depart from it. For that passage you quoted. Yeah. Yeah, you, you're combining two passages. Okay. Okay, so Any, let's, let's try and get the exegesis right. Oh, well... Um, if, <laughs> if, if I'm quoting it wrong, then I wouldn't ask the question anymore. It wouldn't make sense. Okay. Yeah, because th there are two things you're dealing with, you know, so you combine both of them, it, it can be confusing. Okay. All right. And you say, remember your creator in the days of your youth before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Okay. So you combine that with another passage. When you bring them together, you can make it say what you want, but that's not what the Bible is saying. That's why I'm cautioning you on that. Okay, one more, and then we're going to move on. I had a comment for um, Joanna's question. I think that there are two aspects. One, if you think about the parable of the sower, how the seed, you know, fell up. There was different... Um, Reactions. So some people, you know, said they accepted it, but then the things of the world made it choke away and they, they fell away. And I think because there's no time limit on that, someone yes. can be in the church for five years and then something happens and they say, well, you know, I don't believe anymore and they fall away. And that could be the same thing as that parable. I also think that there's been people, if you ask the right questions and talk to them, sometimes they'll, re they'll reveal what their real theology is or what they really understand about salvation just by having a conversation with them. So if I sit down with someone and I say, hey, you know, you went to church, like, yeah, I believe in God and everything, but, you know, Jesus, he, he didn't really exist. He's just in our hearts. You're like, oh, okay, well, that's revealing. Yeah. So, and so that, I think and that, that is too. in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Uh, again, uh, we're going to end that section, <laughs> okay? But, but the point basically is this, is 
I am not responsible for somebody's salvation. But as a teacher and as a discipler, I'm not sure there's a word like that. I am responsible for making sure I lead people to the way of Christ. And churches are supposed to do that because that's what Jesus said. The great commission that we always quote, it says it's in there. So you can train them and so that they can remain in the faith that they confess. So that's really important. Are you raising your hand, Moses? Or are you just stretching? Okay. All right. Okay. Let's, uh, I hope we did, uh, I think, well, apostasy basically is denying the faith, okay? And uh, once you deny the faith, you cannot say you believe in what you just denied, right? Mm-hmm. So it's, it's impossible. Yes. Question two or a different one? Question two. Okay. My friend and I are both crush- Christians. We believe the Bible as the sole authority in matters of faith and practice, but we are having trouble using biblical language to describe our feelings on a particular subject. The world uses the term vibe or energy to describe the feeling of someone's or something's demeanor or unspoken essence. For example, the woman, the woman who is smiling in our face and praising us, yet you can feel something is not right with this person. Or when someone is constantly negative and selfish, that just by being around them, you become negative. We know as Christians, we have discernment given by the Holy Spirit, but when non-Christians use the term, they obviously aren't talking about discernment by the Holy Spirit. What's the best way to describe what we are all feeling? Christian discernment. I don't know. That's a very difficult uh, question because um, you may not even have the gift of discernment but you can also tell when somebody is uh, uh, not being sincere, you know. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, again, I think you basically answer your own question because Christians should uh, have discernment because you have the Holy Spirit living in you, and the Holy Spirit living in you is able to show to you when things are right and when things are wrong so that you can follow the Spirit. Also, you have to stay constantly in prayer because a lot of these things you don't know unless you've been spending time with God and you've been spending time in your Bible. And that's how you know a lot of other things that usually will be deceived by uh, people. Okay, on there and then Frida. I'm sorry I'm asking so many questions. but Go ahead. Yeah, if someone has discernment, they would know, correct? They should know. Yeah, they should know. So they can use it on anyone or to determine anything about anyone, correct? They should be able to. It's a gift that they have. Correct. They should be able to. Correct. Exactly. And they they should know what it does. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the Holy Spirit does. Now, it doesn't mean, though, that every Christian has the gift of discernment because there is no one gift that every Christian has or should have. Even if you hear people telling you, you, if you don't speak in tongues, you're not a Christian, that's not biblical. There's no gift that the Holy Spirit gives that's a determinant of your Christian status. Amen. Amen. Yes, go ahead. It's, it's, it's not really a question, just a comment, because um, I think you've already answered the question, but when it comes to using the word vibe and energy, I just think that's something that Christians should stay away from because it's directly related to the New Age theology. Correct. And you, if you're using the same terminology that Buddhists are using, uh, you should change your terminology. Okay, Kiara. <laughs> so if the word is not vibe or energy, what is the word? Well, we said discernment. Discernment, okay. Or you can say the spirit is telling me. Okay. Okay, now... But well, that's very, very, you have to be very careful also of the terminology that you use. Because I think many times we Christians use God's name in vain more than the non-Christians. When you say God told me, you know God didn't tell you. 
especially people who want the pastor to do something, they come to me and say, God told me this. I said, well, he hasn't told me yet. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so we have to be very careful, and uh, just because you put God beside something doesn't mean I'm going to accept it as being true. Amen. Yes. So if a, a Buddhist is in a room, a Christian is in a room, and a, a, an atheist um, is in a room, and a man walks in, and all three of them say something's going on with this man. Yes. The Buddhist and the atheist don't have Christian discernment. Yes. So they couldn't, what they're feeling, they couldn't call discernment. Now, they may call it something like energy Correct. or vibe or something like Correct. that. Correct. But, so but what will we say all three of us are, are feeling? And so all, what's the term? all three of you are created in the image of God. There's still, there's no person on earth that is devoid of, the nature of God, okay, whether they're Christians or not, God gave every creation, all human beings, he gave them intellect, emotion, and will. That is characteristics of him. They can still use that even though they're not Christians. Christians just have a plus, Because we are led by the Spirit of God. Okay. Uh, yes, go ahead. I just want to comment on uh, what we're all feeling is uh, influence. Sometimes we're drinking alcohol, and we get <laughs> under the influence of the alcohol, and we feel differently, correct? Yes. Sometimes we have the Holy Spirit when we're Christians. God gives us Holy Spirit. And we're in a room with a Muslim or a, and an atheist. We also need to remember that the, uh, there's other influence there too. And Satan is always trying to influence even us Christians. But he's also, those people could be under his influence also. Correct. And so what we are feeling sometimes is that influence, whether it be truth or lie. For and we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. You know, so we have to consist, constantly be under uh, the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Okay, David. Did you have one? <laughs> no. Oh, you do. Okay. So I guess in short, wouldn't the correct term just be spirit then? Wouldn't Led that, by the spirit. I mean, yeah, so to answer like if... Um, so the case, in, the case that Shantae brought up, where yes. atheist, Muslim, and uh -huh. so and so were all in a room, and, and a fourth person walks in, and everybody feels the same. Uh, yeah, the everybody gets that off feeling. Wouldn't that? Wouldn't can you? Can that be defined as a spirit, possibly? Or is that not like a definitive? A spirit or the spirit? Okay, a spirit or the spirit. Okay. Okay. I, yeah, I guess my, my whole thing is that, like, or the thought that I had was that I don't see how the term spirit would be wrong. It's, it's proven that everybody else is right in that this, in using the term spirit is wrong versus being hesitant to use the word spirit versus vibe or energy well, or whatever because it would be. There, remember now there are different kinds of spirits. So the spirit we're talking about today is the Holy Spirit. And, and I think as Christians, we need to distinguish that. So if you're in a room with a Jehovah Witness, they're not talking about the spirit. They're talking about a spirit. Mm -hmm. So we're not being controlled by the same person. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Yes. But we also receive instinct, right? Would that be what they're talking about? If a third person? Fourth person walked in the room and perhaps he was angry. You would feel that energy, or, or and okay, but no, that that has nothing to do with Christianity. No, we're talking about, but in reference to vibe and energy, we have the gift as human beings in general to follow your motherly instincts, to follow your instincts, to know if you should stay away from a situation or if you feel a situation is welcoming, depending on. Who is there? Do you know what I'm saying? Regardless of religiosity or, or religion or whatever, you can feel a person's 
energy as to whether or not you should approach okay. them or not. I right? just feel personally, based on my understanding of the message of the Bible, that there is a difference between instinct and vibes and energy to the leading of the Holy Spirit. We cannot group them together. They're not the same things. Yes. Oh, that, your, nope. the question has been answered. Okay, Gina. So I think, you know, as Christians, when we deal with this, and it's not their aura. It's, you know, I think when we sense something is off, it's a time to pray and figure out what is it. Because it's not about titling it, but it's about figuring out what we're supposed to do with it. And I'll give an example. One Sunday morning down in this, in, when we were in Marin City, this guy walked in. I think he came in Sunday school, sat on the front seat, and it's like by the end of Sunday school, we knew that was trouble sitting in the chair. And we said, he is here to destroy. He's here to discredit. He's here to, and it's like, well, we just prayed. And I think within two weeks, that man was gone. And so it's not so much about labeling it, but it's about recognizing something's not right with God gave us discernment mm -hmm. and then praying about it and getting rid of it. But it's, we can't say aura, you know, but it's. There's usually a specific, if it's evil, there's usually some sort of specific demonic something tied to it. And we have to pray and deal with that. And I also think that, I don't know if we're, we're not dealing with the same issue, but there was also a Sunday where in the church I came in, and most of you that are not familiar with the history of Village Baptist Church, there was a time we used to have deacons sit in front. The deacons would sit in the front of the church every service. And I came from my study to worship, and I saw this man sitting with the deacons in the front. Uh, some of you may still remember. And immediately, I acted on it right away. So I asked him why he was sitting there. And he said, they invited me to come sit here. I said, who are they? And he pointed to the deacons. I said, they, have, they do not have that authority. He said, oh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not doing anything. Well, apparently, I sat down with the deacons after. And I said, uh, I'm the leader of this church. If you're going to seat anybody where the leaders are sitting, you need to check with me. So why was that man sitting there? They said, oh, he came to Sunday school and... He was quoting verses here and there and, and uh, you know, and I'm scratching my head. And I'm saying, we put you in that position after years of testing your character, testing your beliefs, setting that, and you think it's okay for you to put somebody in there you just met? Well, Find out later, one, this man actually duped one of the deacons later on. He's been going around to different churches doing that. So uh, there are just some things that are not right and you need to deal with right away. I didn't tell them the Holy Spirit led me to talk to you guys. Amen. Mm, amen. Well, that we already have we already have principles that are based on the Bible that are already there for us to follow. If you're not following, you need to be confronted right away. Okay, this is your last question. Okay, <laughs> amen. So I think I have a no. I was just kidding. A spiritual gift. Do you think it's okay for me to tell people my spiritual gift, or no? Well, it's okay. Yes. But telling people your spiritual gift does not do anything. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Using your spiritual gift is what does something yes. for the okay. church. So I think I have prophecy, but I don't talk about it too much. Okay. Well, again, I'm, I'm saying that uh, if I've known you for seven years, yes. and I think I've known you for more than that, but I'm not talking particularly about you. I'm yes. talking about somebody. Yes. If I know somebody as a Christian for seven years and they've never used that gift, they should not be telling me they have it. Okay. I, I understand that. Yeah. But we were talking about Muslims and Buddhists and stuff like that. Okay. Anyways. Uh, I just want to say something about spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts, I feel those are blessings. You get those gifts from Yahweh. We're 
Yes, Jesus. All right. The Father. Correct? You get them from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Okay. Yes. You get them from the Holy Spirit. But I don't think that a person that is doing wrong should have a gift because gifts are special. Do you have the gift? Do I have a gift of what? You say you have the gift of prophecy. I believe I have a gift of prophecy. Have you ever done anything wrong? I have, yes. So should you have the gift? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying okay. I'm saying that if I have prophecy, then I'm created in a new way. I have a new gift. I'm supposed to go this way. I, I can profit, but I have to go a certain way. I can't go back to my old ways. Well, I have this gift. If I go back to my old ways, those are old ways. Maybe I, I can't profit anymore. I'm saying people may not have gifts. They think they have gifts because they're getting held back. They're not blessed. Well, if you're not... If you're not using your spiritual gift, you're not blessing the body of Christ. The spiritual okay. gift is not for you to be blessed. The spiritual gift is for you to bless others. Amen. Exactly. You're, okay. You're, you're. And there are rules that are set already in the Bible as to how to use it, when to use it, and in the situation in which you find yourself. So, uh, again, I think... I think we may be going to another area that uh, we're not. Pre what do you want me all? What do you all want to do? Uh, this is the second question, I'm and our time is up. Yeah. So we'll use it for the next time. Okay. You have one final word. I and mean, I was just saying about um, was isn't Muslim uh, religion based off of a prophet? Yes, Prophet Muhammad. So if God gave us another prophet, don't you think we could understand what was going on or how he was profiting? God already said in the book of Hebrews, he's not going to give you another prophet. In these last days, he has spoken to, to us through a son. If you look at the Greek grammar in there, it's in the perfect tense. It's actually in the pluperfect, which means he was, he is, and he will be forevermore. No other prophets. There would be Period. no prophets. So that's not a gift then? No. Jesus is the prophet. No other prophet coming that you should be following. Period. No discussion. No argument. Jesus is the last Adam. You don't have anyone else coming. If anybody is teaching you that, they are teaching you something that's against the word of God. Amen? All right, let us stand for prayer. <laughs>